wake up call, I guess. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a wonderful day outside. It, it's not too hot, not too cool. Great fall day. Something to look forward to. So we look forward to uh, spending some time together here today and, and listening to God's word. We got several people out that are sick uh, this week and, and that couldn't be here today. So uh, we ask blessings upon those people as well. And and uh, so a lot of fun things going on in here as we take a look at our schedule coming up. Um, if you're online watching us today, welcome. Let us know you're here. Uh, comment in the comment section down there and, and just tell us that you're with us here this morning. Nice to see some visitors here as well this morning, so welcome. Um, this Wednesday, we're going to continue on with our series with The Chosen at 7 p.m. We ran into some people last night. We went to get uh, pizza with Liam and, and uh, ran into Mark and Amy, and, and so I invited them to come and join us on, on uh, Wednesday night. And she says, you know, I bought all three DVDs. I just love The Chosen. I have to agree with her. Everybody that I've talked to had a guy message me from Minneapolis that follows us on a regular basis. He says, boy, you guys got to really do the chosen if you haven't been doing it already. And I said, pay attention. So, <laughs> so it's a wonderful, wonderful program. And I invite anybody uh, that's able to uh, check it out and, and just learn and get that experience of joining together uh, in the life of Christ. Our next men's breakfast is coming up October 7th and uh, 9 o'clock here. We're going to convert this whole area back into a restaurant and we're going to have our, our uh, Blackstone Grill in here. We'll be grilling up some things and uh, I'm sure there'll be biscuits and gravy and, and breakfast sandwiches. Those are kind of fun to make actually, so we get to make breakfast sandwiches in here. And we have no rules on what you can make the sandwich out of, so you can make it out of pancakes. <laughs> English muffins, whatever you, whatever you're called to do, you can make it out of it. Uh, that evening, then on October seventh, we're going to be having the Chronicles of Narnia, the second in the series of three, and that is Prince Caspian is the name of that one there. And uh, so they're excellent, excellent movie series to go through. And then coming up then in November, we'll be showing the third in the series uh, of the Dawn Treader in there. So uh, a lot of fun things going on there. Yesterday we filled the place up with people in here and we had Orange Track Racing and that comes up again then on, uh, let's see, that'll be October 14th. Yeah, October 14th. Oh, it's right on the screen. Mark, look up. Uh, October 14th and uh, so we only have October and then the season ends in November. So we follow NASCAR. NASCAR runs February through November. And so we're going to be racing again. Yesterday we had a table filled up back there. And uh, we had some cars donated to us that we sold for a dollar a car. And some of these were collector's item cars and things like that. But we sold 259 cars here yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a nice fundraiser. So they were donated into us so that we could use them as a fundraiser. And we took advantage of it yesterday. Uh, it, was, it was really good. There's some really neat cars in there that they had in the, in the packages as well. So um, today's worship then for the people online is in the section in there. We've got a link to it, to the YouTube, so that you'll be able to join in with the music on there. We can't broadcast the music live because of the licensing. Um, so you can click on the link and follow on, uh, along on YouTube instead. So let's, uh, let's open our time of worship with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, as we come upon the eve of September 11th, we're called to remember how you brought us through evil in the world. Uh, and we ask, Lord, because we know that you have enough love to surround this whole earth with your love and your grace and your mercy and we just ask for that today we ask for those who would do evil to have a change of heart to soften their hearts and to bring them back into your world lord so that we don't have to face all of the evil every day we ask those who are struggling or those who have wandered away we ask that we would have that opportunity to bring them back into your 
presence back into the fold, if you will. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for the message that you've given Pastor Terry to give today. And we ask that you would just open our ears to hear and our minds to understand it, to, to take on the relevance of it, our hearts to accept that message into that so that we can live it out each and every day. We praise you and thank you in all these things. So our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 139, 7 through 10 from the New Living Translation. And it says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Now that should tell us right off the top that you know, this is an awesome, awesome promise from God. Because when we feel apart from God, when we're, when we're kind of struggling and we're lost, and we're lost either mentally or spiritually, when we can't see God at work in our lives, it just seems to get lost in the process. Both our emotional and our physical natures result from God's creative activity. So when we can't see God in things, we lose sight of those things. And we lose sight of that that natural creative activity that God puts into our lives. The entire process from life and conception onwards through our whole life is because of God's creative power and because of his wisdom. He has a plan for our lives. And if we can't see that, then we can't know the presence of God. And so he gives us this verse in here that we can never escape from your spirit. In his care and concern, see, he knows everything about us. Everything about us. We can never escape God's attention. It's always there. All we have to do is call out his name. How do we do that? Through prayer. So we can never escape God's attention. From the highest mountain to the depths of the ocean, God is there. God is with us the whole time. And here the psalmist reminds us that we are always in the presence of God, I'm under God's control. Now, he gives us free will, and we kind of stray away from God's control. We stay with, stray away from God's presence at times in our lives. But how do we respond to a life totally under God's control? If we pray to God, if we commune together like we are here today, join together in a church service, then God's presence is there with us because his word tells us and it promises us that wherever two or more are gathered together in his name, there I am amongst you. So he gives us that promise that while we're here communing together, that he is here with us, and all we have to do is reach out to him and talk to him. So we can respond in fear because of sin when we try and hide from God. I kind of talked about that in last week's message. Or we can resign and quit trying because of God's power. And we just kind of let God drop off to the side. That's when we get lost from God and lost from his presence. But the psalmist showed us a different way. We can praise God for his greatness because he guides us faithfully through life. In the highest places to the lowest places, he's with there. He's with us always, and all we have to do is call upon his name. And because he guides us faithfully through life, he made us well. He made us to be in communion with him as well. He's interested in each and, each and every one of our days of our lives because we can take our complaints to him. We can take our needs to him. Now, it doesn't mean we come to him with that Christmas list type thing. Dear God, I want this. I want a new car. I want a new house. I want all these kind of things. He's not Santa Claus. He's not <laughs> Santa Claus. But if we come to him with things that we need, he will fulfill the needs in our lives. might not give us everything we want, but he will give us what we need. And so because of this, he reveals our sin and then leads us away from it. Because that sin will separate us from his presence. And he gives us the assurance that he is always there for us, even in the midst of life, even in the midst of all the stuff going on there. He's there with us the whole time. And we have that assurance. We have that promise. That assurance means that we are assured that we will be in his presence no matter where we are. And that's what this psalm is talking about today. So Lord, as we hear the message that Terry brings to us today, open our hearts to take that message on. Open our ears to hear it. 
and to understand fully what you have given him to share with us today. And we pray to you and thank you in all these things. I have to be different. I don't know if anybody notices, but sometimes my hair is straight. Sometimes it's, I, I just, I can't even drive the same way anywhere. So I had to come in from a different side today. Thank you, Mark. Um, we used this before and we, we've heard it several times throughout this series. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. It just is permeating. It's almost like the, the five, loaves and the two fishes that we keep hearing, five and two. And so it, it just it fits this one because think about it. Have you ever had a time when you felt rejected or unwanted? Have you ever had that time where you were waiting on the side, waiting for someone to pick you for a team and you're the last one? Have you ever felt like your past is haunting? These are all rhetorical. Nobody has to answer these, but I can honestly say, yes, I have. The past has a tendency to do that. It's Satan trying to stir it up in you and trying to get you to think of the things that you no longer need to think of. Well, this week's episode begins with Mary Magdalene out picking persimmons. And she is just in a, the mood that she's in, she's in this great mood. She's carrying her basket. She's picking the persimmons. And as she does so, she's reciting the following blessing. And on the screen, you will also see it written in the Hebrew, because I thought it just it was uh, something that was fun to do. But blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who left out nothing in his world and created pleasant creations and good trees so that people can derive benefit from them. Now, if you're able to read Hebrew, you want to read the opposite direction. We read left to right, they read right to left. But after this, after she's reciting this verse, she recites the verse that Philip taught Matthew, and Matthew then subsequently taught Mary and Rama, and that is Psalm 139, verse 8. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Her joy and peace as she's picking these persimmons are abruptly interrupted by the sound of a horse and she looks up and she sees a Roman soldier. She's alone out in the field picking these persimmons and the soldier rides into the area. Well, if you remember her story, her backstory, it was a Roman soldier that first assaulted her, that led her down that path, that where she ended up being, <laughs> where the demons were in her. She immediately drops that basket and she runs and to try and hide behind this tree, haunted by this past. See, none of us are immune to this. There are things that are going to trigger memories. I've had things trigger memories from decades ago that I had completely forgotten about. They happen. But here's the difference between someone who is maturing in their faith and someone who, like Mary, is new in the faith, is that we know how to get through these episodes. Because Mary is new to her faith, and like so many others, this confrontation for her shakes her figuratively and metaphorically as she remembers the demons that were in her. And it shook her to the core. And even though she has a great support group in Jesus and the others, she withdraws. She doesn't even pick up her basket of persimmons. She just runs back to the camp. And she starts to exhibit behaviors that others have not seen in her before. She starts to become that person that she was before. She starts to withdraw. Now this, this whole episode, I, I want to preface here before I go any further, is none, none of the 
things that are happening throughout this current episode are in the Bible. These are those parts of the chosen where the writers, Dallas and the other writers have gone in and they have filled in some of those gaps to help us better understand maybe what they were going through. So she heads back and she meets up with Rama and she has been spending time with Rama teaching her how to read. Now for all, most of us, reading is pretty simple. We've been doing it since we were, I remember the first time I read a book to my mom and dad. Read it from front to back, except it was upside down. <laughs> I had memorized the book that my mom had read to me. But after that, I, I have developed this love for reading. And for those of you that are here, you can see we've got a bookcase in the back. There's just a handful of books on there. I physically probably have 3,000 books and another several hundred electronic books. I just love to read. And so reading is simple for us, but as, an, as you get older, learning new things can be a little more difficult. See, I downloaded the, an app to relearn how to speak and read French because I love the language. I love the experience of that as a kid. So I wanted to relearn that. And then I thought, ooh, maybe I'll just use that same app to learn myself some Hebrew. That's why I included it on that slide. That's much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Even the French that I knew 40 years ago, eh, not so much. So I understand how Rama is struggling with this and she's going through this. But Mary steps out of character. She becomes short with Rama. It's not because of, of Rama, it's, it's simply because of what Mary is starting to go through. She does step away and comes back and apologizes and starts to explain what was wrong. But then she drops it. She doesn't completely explain it. She doesn't share what she's going through. And as Christians, that's something that we have the benefit of. We've talked about uh, the fact that Wednesday nights when we come together and we worship and we Bible study together, this is the safest place you could possibly be because you can share anything and not be judged and know that it will not leave this, this space. It stays here. And avoiding things like this doesn't make them go away. And you can probably all attest to avoiding your problems just pushes them maybe further down deep and eventually maybe they boil over and explode or something happens and it just makes things worse. Well, the beauty is God places people in our lives to share these things with and to help us work through them. And there are several different things that are going on throughout this episode besides what is happening with Mary. This episode is like, unfortunately, most of you didn't know my mom. She passed eight years ago. But this episode is a lot like my mom. Here, a conversation with my mom was eight different conversations all at once and in no particular order. Here, 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 back here. Mark gets the experience of talking to me on when, um, when we meet and going, huh, what? I've gone from this conversation to this one and back to this one. And I lost him between here and here and now I'm back here again. That's what this episode felt like to me. But as these things are going on with Mary, we switch gears and, and we see Jesse. And if you remember Jesse, he's from our previous episode. He's the paralytic that was healed by Jesus. And you see, Jesus wanted Jesse. That is why he made a special trip to heal him. If you remember watching the episode, he... It was like a beeline. Once they came into the area where Jesse was, he made a beeline for Jesse and started to talk to him and ultimately healed him. And now Jesse, who had been paralyzed, was healed, and he is being questioned by the Pharisees, Yanni and Shmuel. And after being healed, he is confronted by them who are asking him, Who healed you? Well, he says, Jesus. And they're like, you know, there's like a million people here right now for the festival. There's probably a thousand Jesuses. Um, but no matter what these Pharisees threw at him and how they treated him and the questions they asked him, 
they could not sway him from what had happened and the love that he felt but from not being needed by but being wanted by Jesus. And as he left them, he's confronted by a, a different character in this episode, and his name is Atticus. And nothing Atticus could say. In fact, we, you got you to gotta join us Wednesday to watch this episode because as he's talking to Atticus, Atticus is listening and taking in, because he's a Roman soldier. He's taking in what he's hearing, and you can almost see the wheels turning his head that, oh wow, a Messiah, what do we got coming up here with the Jews? But his joy and his newfound life could not be dissuaded. It is in the healing of Jesse that Simon the Zealot is saved. Because the way that this episode is written, Simon the Zealot is Jesse's brother. And Simon was on his way to murder the Roman. And Atticus was there to stop him. There's this whole dynamic going on here. Jesus healing Jesse stops him from his murderous mission because Jesus wanted Simon. Starting to get the, the theme here, Jesus wanted. And now... Simon is on his way to find Jesus. And along the way, we catch up with Simon saying a common blessing called the Eloi Neshama. And it's this, my God, the soul that you placed within me is pure. You created it. You formed it. You breathed it into me and you preserve it within me. And in the future, you will take it from me and restore it in the time to come. All the time that this soul is within me, I am thankful before you, Adonai, my God and the God of my fathers, ruler of all creation, Lord of all the souls. Blessed are you, Adonai, who restores souls to dead bodies. See, the Simons, so now we have two Simons. We've got Simon the Zealot, we have Simon, son of Zebedee, and these two, what do we know about these? Well, if you've been watching, you know that both of them are ready to go to battle. They want to fight. They want to take on the Romans. They are prepared to go to battle physically for the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't need them for that. But Jesus still wants them both. And like each of them, many have unresolved issues that are left buried deep inside. We see this throughout the episodes with uh, Simon, son of Zebedee. We see that constantly throughout this. Then we have a new character joining us in John the Baptist. And he is, he's angry. He, he, he is just beside himself with what Herod is doing. And see, Herod, well, he's divorcing his wife so he can marry someone else, his sister-in-law. And all of this goes against the Jewish law. And, well, this part of this episode is leading up to and setting up what will happen to John. Now, we've all, most of us have read the Bible. Of those of you online, uh, most of you know this, but if you haven't read the Bible, it is because of him going to Herod and calling him out on this sin that he ultimately is beheaded. So all of these storylines are being filled in. However, what happens could likely have been happening at that time. We don't know. Because there's no way to have recorded. Well, you know, as we watch the episodes, Matthew is constantly in his little journal writing things down. But there's no way to record everything. Think about the, your life and the things that happen to you on a daily basis. Is there any possible way for you to write down every single thing that was said or done throughout the course of your day. It just doesn't happen. And when we remember back on those things, and we might remember them just a little different than the way they actually happened. But that's what's going on here. So they filled these in. And, but 
The important part is that Jesus wants us and he's willing to do things that capture our attention. But are you paying attention? Jesus wanted Mary. That is why he went to her when she was at that bar. And as she left, he went to her and he cast the demons from her. And this episode shows us that Mary still has some things to work on. I still have things to work on, as I'm sure all of you do. We all do. But this is why spending time with God and studying his word is so very important. Mary has already been spooked. But as the man with the demon comes into the camp, she can sense his arrival. She hears him. But not only that, there's a, a change in the air. It's almost like she can smell the demon coming in. What Mary and the others would find out in this is that you cannot confront a demon on your own. So in this, we see Mary trying to reason with the demon. She tries to get the man to say his name. And the demon mocks her. It's a battle we cannot fight alone. And if we look at Matthew 12, Jesus makes this abundantly clear. He says, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none, then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home swept and in order. That's what I see in Mary. Her home is empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. This is what Mary is afraid of. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. Now, let's talk about this passage just a little bit. What Jesus is getting at here is that just cleaning up your life without filling it with God leaves you vulnerable. Mary is trying to fill it with God. She is trying to learn the scriptures. That's she understands that that is necessary. But it's also like closing the door on your old life, but either leaving it unlocked or the door partially open. This gives Satan the opportunity to open that door up again. The book of Ezra is a great example of this. The people rid themselves of idolatry in the book of Ezra, but they failed to replace it with God. By not replacing the idolatry with the love for God and obedience to him, they left the door wide open. So unless the Holy Spirit resides in the heart, unholy spirits then have the opportunity to enter. So it's imperative that we fill our lives with God's word and allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. So will you stumble and fall? Yep, you bet you will. I'm not calling anybody out on anything. It's just a matter of fact. We all stumble, we all fall. But Listen to this good news that Paul wrote to the Romans. This comes from Romans 8, verse 9. It says, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. If you have sincerely accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you, then you have closed and locked that door. And as you continue on your walk with Jesus, you will begin to act as he directs you to act. You will begin to love as he directs you to love. And you will find the help you need to the problems that you run into in your daily life. Keep reading, keep praying, keep giving everything to God, and he will empower you. As you do these things, you will be serving God, and you will be a part of building up his church. Now, sometime today after you go home, I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to go back. I want you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and I want you to read verses 1 through 17 because it takes this and it expands on it. And there's so much more meat in that message, but I want you to do that on your own time. But the title of, or the head of this section in my Bible is called Life in the Spirit. It's a very empowering message. So, back to our story. What happened to the demon? 
What happened to the man as he came into the camp? Well, I already told you, Mary tried to reason with him to try to get him to say his name. And said he mocked her and he pulled something out of her past. He called her Lilith. He said, they've told me about you. I don't know about you, but that just sends chills through my body. Then as the man was about to attack her, we see Simon the Zealot jump into the scene with his knife drawn, and he jumps the man. Well, this man is filled with demons. The knife goes flying off in one direction, and he is on top of Simon, and that look in Simon's eyes is like, I might die. And just as we think all hope is gone in the scene we hear in the distance leave him Jesus is running back to the camp telling the demons to leave who we find out is Caleb to get out of him now again this isn't recorded in the Bible but there are several instances throughout scripture where we see Jesus cast out demons. One of those comes from Matthew 8, 28 through 34, where it says, when Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes, two men who were possessed by demons met him. They came out of the tombs and were so violent that no one could go through that area. They began screaming at him, and I've heard this in shows and movies and such, and, the, the haunting voice that you hear is, why are you interfering with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the distance, so the demons begged, if you cast us out, send us into that herd of pigs. Jesus says three words. He says, all right, go. So the demons came out of the men and entered the pigs, and the whole herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town, telling everyone what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the entire town came out to meet Jesus, but they begged him to go away and leave them alone. I chose this particular one because this particular instance is telling us how we should treat others. It's telling us that Jesus wants everyone. And you want to know why? Because these demon-possessed men were unclean in three ways. Number one, they weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. We hear Jesus is said in the scripture. We hear in the scriptures, Jesus was sent for the Jews. But here, he helps these two Gentile men. Number two, they were both demon-possessed. And number three, they lived in a cemetery. I don't know about y'all, but I don't even like being near a cemetery if I don't have to be. There's just something that's always creeped me out since I was a kid. But here's the thing. Jesus helped them anyway. By Jesus' example, we should help those who need to be touched by his love. The world claims to not know Jesus, but demons do. They knew their fate. They wanted to know why he was interfering with them. Why he was there to torture them before the appointed time. Revelation 20.10 says, Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. They knew that was the next thing. Come Jesus' appointed time, they knew that was the next. So why did the demons go into the pigs and then go off the, off the cliff? Demons are destructive. They want to destroy, whether it's your life or whatever. So if they couldn't destroy the man, they were going to destroy the pigs. And the only way they could destroy the pigs was to kill them. So they ran off the cliff. See, every human life is important to Jesus, Jew and Gentile. And after checking, so back to our story, after checking on Caleb, the man who had been possessed, Jesus gives directions to others, tells the people what to do. 
And it is only Jesus that notices Mary pick up her bag and leave. He then says, Rama, go check on her. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to get part of this story of what happens after that in this episode, so we'll have to wait. So we aren't going to watch two episodes again this week, but it's interesting how we can fall back into the things that we go into. And I mentioned these things. I give these little nuggets because I want to entice you. I want to pull you in on Wednesday night. We want to have you join us on Wednesdays to watch these with us. But then Jesus speaks with Simon the Zealot alone. And Simon asks Jesus why he needed him. And in the episode, Jesus looks him into the eyes and says, I have everything I need, but I wanted you. So I hope by now that you're seeing this theme that Jesus doesn't need us, but Jesus wants us. Is there something in your life that makes you feel like he wouldn't want you? Is there something in your past that makes you feel like you're not worthy of Jesus wanting you? You can put that aside. Jesus wants each of us. Now, in that day and time, the people wanted Jesus to get on with it. They wanted him to go to battle with the Romans. They wanted him to gather up his army and go defeat the Romans. But that's not why he was there. That's what they were ready for. They were ready for Jesus to do one thing, but Jesus' mission was something completely different. Has that ever been true for you where you were expecting Jesus to do one thing, but he's actually... His plan is something different. Do you ever get antsy when you feel like Jesus isn't moving fast enough in your life? Jesus did say that he was going to tell stories that make sense to some people, but not to others. You ever read the scriptures and it's like, oh, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I told you all after I went to that Promise Keepers background three, I blazed through all four of the Gospels. Got through Acts, got to Romans, and was like, what the heck does this mean? And I closed the Bible for six months. Because it didn't make sense. There was other things I needed to learn first before that would make sense. Once we let Jesus in, once we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us, those stories start to make sense. And as you read the scriptures, each time you read a passage, each because you want to read the Bible over and over again. It's the only book I can read over and over again. Because each time I read it, the meaning in it, the meaning of the passage will change based on where I'm at in my walk. But have you ever felt let down as you try to follow Jesus' ways? It's easy to feel let down. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12 that he was given a thorn to keep him from being proud. In verse 7, he tells us, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. And then in verse 8, it says this, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. He wanted to get rid of that thorn. He didn't want it. But each time he said, my grace, and this is Jesus speaking to him, he says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast, Paul says, about my weakness, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecutions, troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This morning before service, Mark and I were talking about some weaknesses that we had walked through in our lives that have, oh, they were thorns. But yet now they have created something much bigger and better and allowed us to minister to others because of it. We didn't, and Paul certainly did not let it stop him, and neither should you. Although he did not receive what he asked for, he received something far greater. He received God's grace. 
He received a stronger character. He received humility. And he received the ability to have empathy for others. And I can see in almost a mirror looking at Mark as we were talking about the, the things that we have received from those trials that we have walked through. And why, why does God heal some and not others? We've had many on our prayer list over the years who have had a disease or, or whatever, and they have not been healed and they passed. You prayed for a young lady here for two or three years. Someone went and put in our path to pray for, and she passed. Why did God take her? When I had gone to a, a national convention for the denomination I was in years ago, I was introduced to a young lady named Reagan. She was eight. Reagan had cancer. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed as a church for her, but God didn't heal her and took her home. But then there's others that we have prayed for and we have seen miraculous healings for. So why does that work? Well, God has a divine purpose and that divine purpose is beyond anything that we can earthly understand. Our job is to simply continue to pray, believe, trust, and care. And if we are wanted by Jesus, then we should be showing that same to them as well. We need to continue to pray, believe, trust, care, and love for others. That's why we go back to this call to worship that we had this morning, where it says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. God meets us where we are at, but he doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us there. Yesterday I talked about a song that was popping through my head as I was doing the devotional. We were talking about September 11th and and we talked about the floods of 08. The song is by Super Chick, and the name of the song is Beauty from Pain. And in the song, it talks about bringing beauty from ashes. And as I was thinking about that, Diane and I had been driving around the city. We were in the Nouveau Czech Village area, and we were looking around and looking at all these new buildings that were going up, and all this development and this beauty that was coming up from this disaster. 15 years, 22 years since 9-11, and out of the ashes, in New York we've seen beautiful new buildings go up, a beautiful reflection pond to commemorate those whose lives were lost, and down in our city we are seeing things come up. God does that with our lives. He brings beauty from those ashes. He brings beauty from our pain because he wants us. Now last week Pastor Mark issued you a challenge and he said this and I, I went and I copied and pasted it directly from his sermon because I wanted to make sure to get it right. He said to ask, to invite, to help plant the seed to bring them back to God. I reiterate this because this is an important challenge. Because people's eternal destinies are at stake. If you have the cure, we have an obligation to share that. We don't keep that to ourselves. If you say you've got a friend over and all of a sudden your dog is like nipping at you and got to go out to the backyard needs to you know, do his business, you go to take your dog out. You get out on the back deck and you notice there's a snake in the back, a venomous snake in the backyard. You pick up the dog and you head back inside. You're not putting your dog out there, right? Well, your friend has already stood up and got their drink in their hand and said, well, I was going to go out and join you. Well, you just said, well, I'm just going to sit down and, and stay in here. And they go outside and they get bit by that venomous snake. They come back in and why did you tell me about the snake? Same thing goes with Jesus. We need to let people know that they are wanted by 
Jesus. We don't want them to end up dying because we didn't tell them. We are all wanted by Jesus. And we have an obligation to share that. Let's do that each and every day of our lives from this moment on. Father God, as we end the sermon this morning, we thank you that you want us. You don't need us. You're omnipresent. You can do anything. You don't need us for anything. You want us. How special are we that of all your creation, of everything that you've made, each one of us is special to you. You want us. Thank you, Father, for making us in your image. Thank you for wanting us. Thank you for showing us that. Let us go out and show everyone else that same love. In Jesus' name. Pastor Terry, as we come into this time of communion this morning, I want you to think of our call to worship today, and I want you to think of it in the terms of God's love, because we can never separate ourselves from the love of God. If we go all the way up to heaven, we have God's love. If we go down to the depths of the ocean, we have God's love. God's love surrounds us. And in my prayer this morning, I prayed that because of God's love is, is so great for us, that's why he wants us. His love is so great, he can surround the whole earth with his love. We have to accept that love in. And I've said it before, and I want to say it again today. You know, when I, when I pray over the elements uh, before anybody gets here in the morning, as I'm preparing communion, both sets of elements. I pray over those, that those who do not have a relationship with God would come into a relationship with God. But more importantly, that they would remember the sacrifice that was made by Christ on the cross. And it would become alive in them. And I pray that over the elements every time we have communion before we get there. Because, see, when, when Christ went to the cross for us, it wasn't the bindings that held him to the cross. It wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. What held him to the cross was that never-ending love that he has for us. That's what held him to the cross. See, that love, we can't escape that love. But we have to accept that love in. And so when we think about our time in communion, we think about that love. We think about the sacrifice that he made to give us that love. To give us life through that love. See, our sins were obliterated on the cross. It doesn't mean that we won't continue to sin, but if we believe and have faith and we accept the love of God, then guess what? Those sins are forgiven. They're as cast as far as the east is from the west. So on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you the symbol of the cross reminds us of that brokenness because we are all broken people and we need to be redeemed by the power of the cross likewise and later on in the meal he took he took juice and wine and filled a cup he said this cup is the new covenant my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin take and drink. So as we come into our time of communion today, I want you to think about those things. He broke his body for us and his blood poured forth to save us, wash us clean from our sins. The body of Christ broken for you. Take Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see everybody here this morning. 
So now it's time for prayers for the people. So if there's anybody that would like prayer, I can uh, pray for them this morning. And I have a few prayer requests already. And okay. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Jane's grandson Jacob broke his wrist yesterday. Jane's grandson mm -hmm. Jacob. Okay. All right. And I'd like to start this morning with Psalms 91, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We lift your mighty name on high this morning, Jesus, for you are our shelter and ever-present help in times of trouble. The world is experiencing many things, hurricanes one after another on both coasts, a severe earthquake in Morocco that has claimed many lives. We know these things must take place, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But as Christians and faithful believers, we will have the hope of salvation that you freely give to those who trust and believe in you. You have not left us here to stumble in the darkness. You have given us a guide to read your word so that we can stand against the powers of this dark world. Your Bible is the living breath word of God and is here to guide and help us through the darkest times in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, for going before us, shedding your blood on the cross, that we may have eternal life if we choose to accept your free gift of salvation. It came at a costly price for you, that we might live and be filled with your Holy Spirit to help us through each and every day. We worship and praise you and honor you, Jesus, for all things great and small. Today, I'd like to lift up Nick for addictions of cigarettes and epileptic seizures he's had since he was young. Father God, I just pray that you will banish this spirit out of his body, Lord Jesus. Just, I rebuke it in Jesus' holy name that you will heal and cleanse his body according to your word, Lord Jesus, and according to your will. I pray for Denny for healing for him, Lord Jesus. I pray that each and every day he will feel much better as he believes in you and um, does your will, Lord Jesus. And I pray for Jane's son, our grandson, Jacob, who broke his wrist. I pray for quick healing and just um, comfort him and Keep him safe from anything else, Lord Jesus, and heal his arm, Father God, perfectly in your will. Today we lift up the families of this church and all their children and grandchildren. Father God, we are all having struggles of heart, mind, and soul, trying to navigate through each day. Some of us are in bodily pain. Some have sadness of hearts, minds troubling, sorrows that cannot shake, or that can shake us to our core. Remind us in the midst of these storms to call on you in prayer for you. We'll never, to call on you in prayer, for you will never leave us or forsake us. There is no place in the depths of our despair that you cannot find us and put us back on the path of healing, of joy, and of happiness. And we must worship your holy name. You say in your word, Matthew 7 and 8, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. In these troubled times, we all need to remember this. We need to trust in your word and we need to obey your word. For you did not send your son into this world to condemn the world, but to save it through Christ Jesus. We will have many troubles in this life, but we can, all, we can all be overcomers if we believe in you, Jesus, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Praise be to God, praise be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Denise. We talked about healing and, and prayer. And 
So many of you remember when I used to have that sling because of my shoulder. And so the, the surgeon I was seeing isn't doing surgery now, so I went to a different one. And when he read the MRI, he had a different opinion. And I looked at Mark and I said, nothing changed other than the fact that I truly, honestly believe God wants me so much that he changed the imaging on that to be from needing that surgery to just needing a steroid shot. I wholeheartedly believe that God can, we put him in this box and we forget that he is bigger than anything else and that he can change anything. He can do anything. And so I truly believe that he works in our best interests. And I thank him for that. I had a different ending for our online portion of our service today, but after just hearing myself preach, hearing God preach through me, and then listening to your prayer this morning, thank you. I want to go back to this prayer that Mark had written for us all to share with this past Lenten season. So this goes back to almost the beginning of the year. So, and if anyone would like this, uh, there's copies of it on the back table. Lord God in heaven, I pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, I ask that by your mighty power that you would bind Satan and all of his minions from every aspect of our lives, as well as those of our family and our church family. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Through, throw the enemy forces into confusion, hampering their plans and shutting down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and we, your people. I pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved. Father, I pray that their hard hearts would be softened and that they would turn back to you, Father God, and they would be made right in your sight through the salvation that comes through accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy and instead of rebellion, there would be repentance. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the commander of heaven's armies, the most high God. Lord, send your warring and protecting angels to surround us and protect us from all evil. I pray that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church, our church family and friends, would be bound away and that they would be overcome by your mighty power. Lord Jesus, we claim this as a victory in your mighty name, and we know that by calling on your name, that you will protect us. All glory, honor, and praise to you forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.